to do something to somebody. How about the weather this weekend? Y'all enjoying that? Man, I'm going to tell you right now, this is, some, this, is, this is the glory of God season for Charleston, South Carolina. Because 100-degree days are coming. So we got to vask in the glory of these like 70, 80 degrees days. It's, it's unbelievable, right? All right, guys. Are you guys ready to go this morning? Here, here's the thing is, is the Lord's not going to lose. But I may lose my voice after a worship set like that. That's a, did the team break? Come on, can we give it up for the team real quick? <laughs> worship team, you guys did an absolutely incredible job. Love that kind of thing. But seriously, just like Becky said, we're in the last part of uh, our Activate series. Uh, how many of you guys heard Pastor Eddie last week? Yeah? So good. Holy cow. Uh, I can just say that if you were not here, if you weren't in the building, man, go back, watch that thing online because it was, it was, it was a very powerful yet profoundly simple and practical message. And if you, if you did not catch that message, man, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to want to go back. Actually, I'll tell you this. For, for me, it was probably one of the top five messages I've heard Eddie give. It was absolutely incredible. So go back, listen to it. You will not uh, be wrong for doing it. It's, it's awesome. All right? All right, so here's the thing. You know, I was praying about this weekend, and, and I kind of felt this prompting to go into a different direction than what we originally came up with in programming. Uh, you see, originally we were going to go with this topic of activating joy. Okay, this was a, a topic that the programming team really thought that would be good to kind of end the series. It's, it's a topic that I'm kind of passionate about. I love joy. I've studied it in scripture a good bit. They felt like it was a characteristic that I kind of display. And so we, that's the direction that we were going in. Uh, but from the very beginning of this whole thing, Pastor Mike set this whole thing up just absolutely beautiful with Activate Faith. And I remember sitting under him and just listening to that message, and it just absolutely rocked my world. Just, just exactly what I needed to hear that weekend. Well, that particular weekend, I was going out of town. And so I was going, somehow my, my GPS got me going through the countryside, right? And everybody knows that the Lord inhabits the countryside when you're driving through right? It was really cold that day, but I was in the country. So I rolled the windows down, put the heat on as high as I possibly could because I was freezing. But I just had this amazing time and this amazing moment with God. And I just really feel like he began to download to me and say, I, I just felt this prompting to kind of, I think I might have to go into a different direction this weekend. So I just want to make sure you guys are okay if we go into a different direction this morning? All right, thank you guys for your overwhelming support on that. That is amazing. So this morning we're going to talk about Activate Joy. Since is it okay if we go into a different direction? Yeah? I'm just making sure because I just want to make sure you guys are ready to lean in because if God is trying to communicate something to us and change this direction, well, I just believe that he might be trying to tell somebody in this room something. Okay? So I just want to make sure we're ready to lean into this thing. So we've been unpacking different ways to activate God into our lives. You see, because just like Becky said, this year is different for us as a church. And what we're saying is this is a year that's being characterized by us, by us not being stuck, right? Not being stagnant. As a group of people, we're diving in. And this year is marked by something different. That as we stay hungry, as we stay hungry for the things that God has for us, not only are we not going to get stuck, but we're going to continually, time and time again, activate this spiritual momentum in our lives. I don't know about you, but I want spiritual momentum to continually happen in my life. Yeah? All right, good. That's what we're going to go after today. And that's really what we see happening here at Cathedral. I mean, even as a staff, we talk about it all the time, that we sense this thing inside of you, of your hunger. And I love that. I absolutely love it. So today what I want to do is I want to coach you a little bit. I want to coach you in the sense that when a move of God was happening in the Bible with a person or, or with Israel as a whole, sometimes what we can do is we can read those stories and we can learn from the steps that they take in that process. What we can do is we can learn from them before we go through that same kind of season. And so that's what I kind of want to go through because here is the reality. The beginning journey, the beginning of really anything is really exciting, right? You know, we start a new job, we start a new school year, or we start into a new ministry. The beginning part, the beginning of a, any project is real exciting, right? But the, 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 the end, right, it can also have its elements of excitement. Because if we follow it out properly, 
Well, then now we're seeing the fruition of what God was doing in our life, and we had this, this kind of celebration time period. Y'all experienced that on Celebration Sunday. As a church, we went through those 21 days, and then we celebrated, and there's, a, there's some fun parts to that whole thing, all right? But the middle area of this journey, well, the middle area can sometimes get a little messy, right? Sometimes this middle zone, the, the, the in-between time periods of our life, sometimes it's just not the prettiest, right? And, and honestly, if we get gut level honest, sometimes it can just feel super frustrating, okay? Like, like how many of you guys agree, if you've gone through a, a middle season in the in-between time, sometimes it feels like that, right? I got my one girl right here. Right here. Okay, we got two more. Is that, am I making sense? Sometimes this middle season, it's just like, are we hearing things right, right? You know, and a, and a lot of us, we might be at different phases in this journey, right? Some of you are in the beginning, and you're super pumped. You, you, you might be part of the 70 or 80-something people who last weekend gave their life to the Lord. So what are they doing? I mean, they're pumped up, excited, because why? They finally filled this hole in their life that they never knew possibly even existed. So they're pumped up. They're on fire. They're ready to go to see what God has for them, right? You may be, you know... On the other end of this whole thing, and, 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 and maybe, maybe you're still working. Yes, you had a great time at the beginning of the year. You feel like God got you on fire. You're ready to roll. But maybe you're still working out the sting of your past. Yeah, you, you laid your past at the cross and what we did on that celebration Sunday. But maybe you're still working out the details of that thing. But it can be so hard sometimes in the middle of this whole thing. But we're all at a different stage. And so what I want to talk about uh, today is I want to bring you some of the greats in the Bible, some of the heroes in the faith, and how they stayed activated in this season of their life, okay? So, but here's the thing. Most people lose sight of the vision that God has for their life somewhere in the middle, that's where the vision begins to leak out. In fact, 1 Peter 4.12 actually tells us to be ready for this exact thing. He tells us this. He says, dear friends, don't be surprised. No, 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 don't be shocked that you're going through testing that is like walking through fire. But here's the cool thing. God is still on the throne. And nothing that is going on in your life right now has caught him by surprise. And we need to realize this as a church, right? He's not like, oh, myself. I, I mean, I guess that's what he says. I don't know what he says up there. Like, oh, myself, right? I didn't see that coming. Like, I cannot believe she didn't get that job. And then he turns to, like, talk to some angels, right? Like, hey, hey, Michael, Gabriel, come over here. Do you remember that girl that I was telling you about last week? Can you believe she didn't get the job? What? No, I can no, nothing that you're going through has caught him off guard. Everything that he has promised to fulfill, and I'm telling you, God is with you. And you see, a lot of times in the beginning, we start off with this boldness, right? We start off with this audacious faith. Like, where's all my starters at this morning? Y'all love to start a new project. Come on. My wife is loud and proud in this department. This, this is my wife. She's an Enneagram 7, got some hair, yeah, I like it. But you love to start a project, like any new idea. My wife will, at the drop of a dime, start a new project or 15. I mean, it is not uncommon for uh, me to come home and there are literally 15 projects going on around in the house. Meanwhile, I'm going, oh, okay, let's breathe. It's a lot of projects, we're gonna get through them. One at a time, hopefully, right? I mean, it is, if it is remotely more interesting than whatever it is she's doing, boom, she's ready to party. Let's do this whole thing. But she loves to start, right? But see, here's the thing is a lot of times in our life, God will give us direction, but not the details. Maybe, maybe that's just me. But, but I think that's a lot of us in this season. I think that's a lot of us specifically here in this church in the season that we're in. Like, he, lo he, he gives us the word, right? And you're like, oh, yeah, yes, God, I'm so ready. I'm so ready for it, right? But then all of a sudden, it's like silence. And you're like, what in the world happened? Like, did, did I hear right? Did, is, 
is this what you wanted me to do? I thought I heard what you had going on. A lot of times he'll give the direction, but he won't give you the details in that moment. Because sometimes in the middle is where God can do his best work. In the middle season, as I look back through my life, in those middle times, in those in-between times, that growth that Eddie talked about this past week, oh, man, I grew more than, man, I can't imagine what I would be if I didn't go through this situation. It's in the middle that I've had more increased faith by going through it than I ever thought possible. It's in the middle that God can do his best work when we keep our attention on him. I know for my wife and I, whenever we were going through something, anytime we were asking God to breathe into a situation, right? Maybe, maybe we have something going on and we're asking, hey, God, I, I need more clarity, right? We all do that. God, I need clarity. Like, I need wisdom, God. I got a big decision coming up, and I just need to know what direction is going on. Even if he was silent, I knew that he was working, Okay? And I've heard it said this way, and, and, I, and I love how this guy said, I wish, I wish whoever said it, uh, I wish I knew who it was so I could give him some credit, but I just I always have logged this inside of my head. And this might be a good phrase for you to kind of attach on to, to reframe your thinking, but this is what they say, I trust him because I know too much about him. Like, here's what I'm saying, I trust him even when I cannot feel him. I trust him even though I can't physically see him working in my life, right? I trust him even though I can't track him. I, I want to know that he's working. But I trust him even though I can't. And when you begin to live life like this, man, when you begin to live, I'm telling you, you're, 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 you're tapping into something amazing. And what you're doing is you're actually tapping into something of what Proverbs tells us about. Because here, here's what it is. Here's what it says in Proverbs chapter 16. He said, a man, man's mind plans his way. And so much of that, that's us. As we journey through life, we're, we're doing everything we can in our, in our own mind to get the plans going, in our own strength, right? But the Lord directs his steps. And not only does he direct his steps, he establishes them. That's the difference. You see, last, last series I talked about an example of, of ways. Where's all my wazers out there? Come on. Got a few of them. Got a few conversions over to the Waze app. That's what I'm talking about. How about Google Maps? Any Google Mappers? A couple Google Mappers. Yeah. Apple Maps? Anybody doing that? It's the one product they got wrong. <laughs> they tell you to turn left when you're supposed to turn right. Waze. Waze. Is... Any map questers? Like you're still printing that junk off. <laughs> right? You're like, mm, they following me. They tracking me. They ain't tracking me. I'm going to print my junk off. Right? But no, seriously, we recently took Baylor... Skiing, skiing for the first time, and uh, we were driving up to Snowshoe, West Virginia. And all of a sudden, my Waze app just started glitching out or something. It kept telling me to, to reroute it, it was recalculating, but it was doing it in a way that it, it was kind of confusing me. Um, and the, the, the thing I actually thought was like, is Siri listening? Like, is Siri take that I'm talking about another GPS system a little bit nicer than what I should be talking about? Anyways, it all came clear because at one point we came to a screeching halt. We came to a complete stop. And I wish I would have taken a picture of it. I didn't, but we've all been in this situation. This is exactly what it looked like out of the front of our thing. And sometimes I just, I got this visual that sometimes this is exactly what our life looks like. We start going our own way and we stop listening to the Holy Spirit. Because I don't want you to forget that the Holy Spirit is always talking. It might be this, this still, small voice, right, as the Bible describes. It, 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 it might be that prompting that you got when you were here on Wednesday morning going through prayer or doing it at your home or in your devotion time. It, it might be that nudge that you, kinda, that, that you get in the middle of worship time. Maybe, it, maybe it's that different kind of prompting or that intuition that you get when you're here on a weekend service. But here's the deal is that the Holy Spirit is always speaking. But the question is is are we letting the distractions of life keep us from listening? Because I want you to remember, the beginning, right, is always exciting. And then we enter into this middle ground where life gets, what, back to normal for us, and, and the distractions that we have start seeping kind of back in. And this is that season of life where the vision that God gave you begins to leak. And time goes on. 
And that voice that he gives us starts getting a little quieter, a little quieter. It gets a little less audible, and then a year goes by, and we're wondering, why am I still here? But we have a decision to make. Are we going to reroute and listen to the promptings, right? Promptings of the Holy Spirit, promptings that God gives us. Or are we going to say, you know what? I know better. I know better. And I'm going to go into that different direction. And what ends up happening is we fall into the traps that we don't know lie ahead. Now, thankfully for us, we barely made it onto that rerouting exit uh, on our way to take Baylor skiing for the first time. And I'm pretty sure it saved us about a good hour, right? Okay. But the truth is, is even when we decide to go our own direction, guess what? God's still speaking. So at any moment that you think, man, I think I've gotten off track, put those antennas back up, and God's right there waiting for you. He's ready for you all the times. But so many times, how often do we do this? We say, you know what, I'm, I can do it on my own. I'm, I can do it on my own accord. I'm talented. I can do this whole thing. I can do it on my own strength. But when we pick this route, what usually ends up happening is we get trapped somewhere in the middle. You see, there's a man in the Bible that we read about, and this is a man that no doubt had some messed up situations, okay? No doubt. And I think we can all agree that David was not perfect by any means. By any stretch of the imagination, David was not perfect. He wasn't perfect, but God had given David a promise. And he says, I'm, I've given you this promise, but God didn't give David all of the details. You see, David knew that he was going to become the king of Israel, because God gave him that promise. But what he didn't realize is that that promise also included him having to defeat a giant that was going to be twice his size. <laughs> it's those details, right? That we feel like, oh, but you told me I was going to be king. I didn't know I was going to have to do all this. David knew and he stood on the promises that he was going to become king because that's what God told him. Oh, but, but, but God didn't tell him that his predecessor, Saul, was going to be chasing him through a desert trying to kill him. And you see, this is why I love reading the Bible, because we can study this complete and perfect book, and we realize that, man, when we read through the great heroes of our faith, we find that there's these common themes all throughout Scripture of what's going on in our own life. And we get this common theme here that he had faith, in the middle section, in the middle season, between the time that God gave the promise and it actually came through. Okay? Tracking with me? All right. When we feel like the promise is so far away, sometimes even when we feel like the promise really honestly feels impossible, and this is kind of where David was, here's that common theme is that he kept moving forward in the journey. And that's my prayer for us this year is that we keep moving forward in the plans that God has already communicated to you. That is what I want to make sure that we get today because that's the, that's the season I kind of see us entering into, you know. Most people by now have stopped going to the gym. I want to make sure that the spiritual momentum does not stop in our life, okay. That's what I'm wanting to get with us. Everybody say keep moving forward. All right, here's what I'm saying. When, when we keep moving forward, when we, when we activate our faith in God alone in these seasons, when we stay hungry for the voice of God, God can and will make things happen that you can't on your own. And I think it's in these seasons when we activate this momentum. I mean, another way to say it is when we activate the perseverance muscle of our spiritual journey, right? That our faith gets stronger and we actually level up. Everybody say level up. I believe that for this year, many of us, this is going to be a level up year. And I'm not just saying that, I'm witnessing it. Just like Becky said, why else in the middle of a pandemic going on would we have the strongest growth track numbers that we've ever had? That's not us. We didn't do any different advertising. Y'all responded to that. That's the own personal journey of what God. Why in the middle of a pandemic do we have more people participating in prayer than we ever have in the history. That's what I'm wondering. God is up to something, and I just want to make sure that we're ready because guess who doesn't like it? The enemy. And so we want to make sure that we're prepared for the seasons that's, that, that, that's laying ahead of us. Here's what Hebrews 11 says. It says, now faith 
brings our hopes into reality and becomes the foundation. Guys, our foundation is getting bigger. Our foundation is getting stronger. It becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things that we long for. It is the evidence required to prove what is still unseen. You think God's up to something good in your life now? Oh, just wait. Keep on waiting, because I'm going to tell you right now, God has even more things that you can never possibly imagine in your head. I'm telling you, a life with Jesus, when we tap into this thing, when we activate this momentum, the spiritual momentum in our life, this kind of stuff comes true in our life. And you look back going, wow, what a ride, MT. He's got more things for you in your business. I saw your video last week. Can we give my man MT a, a hand right here? If you saw that video, I appreciate it, because... God is up to something big in your life, and I can't wait to see what God has for you in your business. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be immeasurably more than everything that you can think up in your head. God has big plans, and he's got big plans for every single one of us, okay? Another Bible hero, a man named Noah, and you see, God gave Noah this promise, okay? He says, hey, hey, I, I need you to listen to me. I need, I need you to work on a project that I have for you. And when we read this story, we actually see that God actually gave Noah a, a great amount of details in the beginning about this promise. And, and naturally, just because of the culture that we live in, we live in an immediate culture, right? We, we want an instant download. We're not used to that waiting. And so when we read this, because he's given so many details in the beginning, we think that, man, he, he downloaded the whole entire promise to Noah, right? But did you realize that Noah was in the middle season for 76 years? 70, hold on, that, that kind of changes the game of the whole Noah story. I thought we had vision, build a boat, go. 76 years? What? So get this, okay. God gave Noah this word, hey, I need you to build a boat, I need you to build an ark. And then what we don't know is we don't know exactly how long it was until God started giving the remaining details. Like, when was this going to happen? Right? But God started off hot with Noah. I mean, listen to this. He gave him all kinds of details. He said, listen, I'm going to get you to build this boat. And I need it to be 450 feet long. I need it to be 75 feet wide, 45 feet tall. It's going to have three different decks on it, divided rooms. You're going to put a door on the side. You're going to have to get one of each animal, male and female. You're going to have to have food, all this kind of stuff. And the list goes on and on. But here's the amazing thing. Especially if you're new to reading the Bible, you can easily over, uh, skip over this kind of stuff or not perceive this going on. But scholars who have studied this intensely, they've been studied this story so deeply, believe at this point on earth, they've never seen rain. Oh, so you're telling me i got to build a boat, but yet ain't nobody know what rain is? You see how the story's changing a little bit? So, so, so for several decades, they watched Noah and his family building this massive boat going, bro, what are you doing? Like, we don't need this big monstrosity. Like, what is this thing? And they're mocking him and they're making fun of him. It makes a little bit more sense now why they were going so hard at him, right? And we don't know exactly how the earth was watered at this time, but rain, they think, did not come from the sky like we're used to today. It may have come from the ground. There's a very plausible theory that if you want to reach, you know, study into it, it's called the vapor canopy theory. That states that we had a completely different upper atmosphere pre-flood, okay? But here's the thing. It's almost for a hundred years, Noah finds himself in the middle. Noah's persevering. And I can imagine at some point, he probably got pretty tired. Like, hey, God... I thought you were communicating something to me. You gave me this big, audacious goal that you put in front of me. I'm doing it. You ever going to have it happen? What's going on? He's persevering. I'm sure he got doubtful. I'm sure he even went through some periods of frustration. But Noah, we see, stayed the course the entire time. And then the flood came, and everything that God said would happen, happened. You see, Noah had audacious deep-rooted, unshakable faith. And I believe that we need to have the same thing happening in our lives today. Come on, when we're in the middle of something going on in our life, we need to have unmovable, unshakable, deep-rooted in the Bible, in the Word of God, in worship, in the presence kind of faith. 
That's what we need. And I believe that if we allow God to be activated in our life, he will do a measuring more than what we can think or imagine. Let me say it this way. God's not a forcer. He's a filler. And if we will make room for him, he'll get all up in our lives and he'll make it way better than what any of us can think up in our heads. Everybody say activate. activate. One of the biggest lies that the enemy loves to put in our head is that we're in this alone. Okay? And if we buy into that, it has a high success rate of throwing us off course. But I want you to listen to me. God is with you every step of the way. You know, when we're, when we're running towards the plans of God, guess who's right there with us? God. When we push the pause button unnecessarily, he's waiting. Saying, come on, let's go. When the enemy is trying to throw us off course, he's fighting. When we're all acting messy up in the club or by the bar, guess who's right beside us? Jesus. Hoping we'd dance a little better. That's a side note. Right? But God is with us. He's with us at the start. He's with us at the end. And he's with us in the middle. He's with you in your marriage. He's with you in the middle of a financial disaster. He's with you in the middle of your addiction. He's with you at the beginning when you get that medical diagnosis that you don't know what the next steps are going to be. He's the God that will meet you no matter what is going on in your life. He's the God of the beginning, he's the God of the end, and he's the God of the middle. One last story for you. Uh, just how God never leaves you and how he's with you every step of the way. And this story doesn't come out of the Bible. This is the pers personal story. Um, but, you know, every single one of us goes through seasons. And I was thinking back through middle moments, moments where... where where Macy and I just were in this in-between place in our lives. And you see, Macy and I found ourselves in a place that we wanted to grow our family. And at this point, we had already had one child. We'd had Baylor, and so we were super excited. But we also had a goal of having more children. But we also had a goal that we wanted our children to be pretty close together. Right? That was a goal of ours. And so we launched off in this endeavor of, like, we want to grow our family. Right? Well, it didn't take too long to figure out that, hey, some something's not right, especially because the first one happened so easily. It was kind of an accident. So we we're like, eh, we, we just pop these things out, right? But we quickly found out that that was not the story. And so being that we had a goal of we want our family to be close in age, we, we like that relational dynamic. We said, hey, let's just cut through some of the tape. Let's just go ahead and go to the doctor. I'm sure it's nothing big, but let, let's just figure out, get back on track, and we'll keep the whole ball rolling, right? Not a big deal. So we decided to go to the doctor. And uh, when we go to the doctor, we figure out that Macy, uh, after a couple different uh, meetings with him, we figure out that Macy has something called PCOS, okay? So if you know nothing about that, all that basically means is an acronym for they don't know exactly what's going on with you. All they do know is that it makes it really hard to have babies, okay? So that's where we are. So we're trying to figure out this whole journey. Uh, and when we met with the doctor, we landed on something called IUI. Okay, and that's where we were going to go next. Um, we felt confident. We felt excited about this whole thing. And so we launched off. We launched off on the first IUI that we had. And uh, what should have taken only three weeks ended up taking a six-week process because of the complications that we were having. Well, the first one just ended up with nothing. It didn't happen. It didn't work. Um, not that it didn't catch us by surprise, but the doctor had kind of let us know that, that you know it's not like a surefire thing. And so we were like, not a problem. Let's sign up for number two. Let's get this thing rolling again. We don't want to waste any time. We sign up for a whole nother IUI. Well, the same thing happens in what should have taken them three weeks because of the complications of that PCOS operating. And I was trying to figure out it took six weeks of a process. Only difference was this one was a little bit different because this one actually ended up in a positive pregnancy test. And man, were we excited. Like, yes, we're staying on track. We're doing all this kind of stuff. We got this positive pregnancy test. And it was pretty quickly after celebrating, a few days had gone by that we realized we were right in the middle of our first miscarriage. And so if you've ever been through that, you know those feelings. If you haven't, it's, it's terrible, 
It's absolutely one of the most atrocious processes that you go through as a couple. It just takes a toll. Uh, and surprisingly, going through that whole thing, we journeyed through it, uh, the emotional journey that you kind of have to go through. And kind of where we landed was we just landed on this whole thing that we held strong to the belief and in, in understanding that God had promised us that we were going to have a family. That's what we felt on the inside of who we were. And so as hard as that was, we didn't let it deter us. We went right back to the doctor and said, hey, listen, we need a different kind of game plan going on here. I don't have unlimited resources. And if you know anything about fertility, it's expensive. Okay? It is real expensive. And so... We started talking, and by now, he knows us a lot better. We know him a lot better. We understand the infertility process. And we land together at this place called IVF. And so we're like, okay, we're, we're signing up for it. We think this is the best next move. Let me take a small pause time out. If you know nothing about IVF, I'm not going to go into the, the details of it, but if you don't know anything about it, here, here's the important things to know, is that this is pretty much your last stop on the journey. Like, this is your best shot. Like, you're throwing everything that the medical community has at infertility. Now, I'll just be honest. For me, this was kind of a tough journey. Because you got to realize, we had already had one son, naturally. So to, so to go from, wait a second, it happened this way, but now we're all the way at the last step? How to, and that was a journey for me. But also along with this IVF process, when you sign up, it is not something you just say, okay, we're doing IVF. Make an appointment next week, and boom, you're pregnant. You know, it's not that. The IVF journey is months and months and months of preparation, right? It's this whole process of the sun, moon, and stars have to line up. You have to lift your right leg, and you have to do everything right for it to line up on one day for the doctors to do what they need to do, okay? So here's where we are. We've, we've gone through months of, of their preparation of what they have for us. And we get to what they call a fertilization day, okay? So we're there, it happens, we're super excited, we're waiting for that phone call to see how it went, and we get the exciting phone call that we have 53 fertilized eggs. <laughs> Meanwhile, your boy over here on this side is like, come on, that's what them ammons do. <laughs> boys will be boys, I'm sorry, that's just how we are. But we're excited because now we're like, man, we got the pick of the litter. This is crazy. This is way more than they thought that we would possibly get. And this is the part of the journey that Macy, if I can just tell you how much she loved this part of the journey. Oh, she loved it. Because here's what they would do. They would call you every morning to give you an update on how your embryos were doing. And Macy, to say that she probably wanted a report on every single one of them, is an understatement. Like, she was so excited because she knew when those phone calls were coming and knew that number. Hey, how'd they do last night? And she wanted that for every one of them. Like, what'd they do? Tell me all about it. Like, she wanted to know about every one. Is that true? You were so excited. And so at the end of this journey, what they do, I don't know why, but at the end of it, once they've matured to whatever level, then they put them in the freezer. Okay? And then you keep going on. So we're waiting for that last phone call. Everything had gone great up until this point. And so we get that last phone call, and a nurse simply says this to Macy. said, hey, I just want to give you an update. I uh, want to let you know that you have three embryos. No, no, no. And Macy goes, I think you actually have the wrong person. Because yesterday I had 53. There's no way that I only have three. And so you can tell immediately after this, she confirmed that, yes, in fact, that was us. We were devastated. 53 down to three? God, what was going on? We were all the way up here, and now it's... And to add insult to injury, the doctor calls pretty shortly after that whole process just to say, hey, what's going on? And that's when we also found out apparently there's a whole grading system to embryos. And, oh, we were at the very bottom. Our embryos were the poorest of qualities that you could have in this whole fertility process. We were devastated. I mean, we went from being at the top of the mountain saying, gosh, we're finally... we give." Man, we're going to have to pick which one we want to put in. So now you're telling me we have three and they're the poorest of quality? Wow. You see, typically in this whole fertility process, you put one. You put one embryo in. Now, Octomom, if you remember that whole process, I don't know what doctor she went to, but you don't put that many embryos in. That's just crazy, okay? But typically in a good facility, you put one. The doctor communicates to us that our embryos are so, such poor quality that he's actually going to break this rule for us and put two in. 
And by now, he had journeyed with us. He had known us. And he says this, this line of, just want to be honest with you, I don't think any of these are going to take. What? But God, we've been on this journey. I, th- I know that you have promised. You have promised us. And right there in that moment, Macy and I just pretty much decided to say, listen, we're going to worship through the pain of this. And we're going to pray like mad. Because what we knew is God didn't need 53. He needed one. And I remember when Macy and I were talking about this this past week, she reminded me when she got off the phone and got that news, she was in the middle of doing her devotions and she had some worship music on. And Good, Good Father was the song that was playing. She still remembers it. And she made the decision, you know, I'm gonna, I, even though this news was devastating, I'm going to worship through my pain. And God, I know you're a good father. I know you have promised us a family. And I'm going to worship through my pain. And the second part of that equation is we enlisted all of our family, all of our friends praying and believing, God, you got three to work with, God. We know all you need is one. And let me give you just a side note about Macy. Because this, this is a part of, of her that just as a husband is a, is a bragging king. Because I would like to say that I had every bit of faith that I needed. But to say this statement, and I can say it with confidence, that even though there was ups and downs in this journey, serious ups and downs, she enjoyed the journey. And here's the reason why. She knew the outcome. She knew that even though it was a bad thing that she had just been discovered, she knew that she was on the winning side of this thing. So no matter what the outcome was, oh, man, this really stinks. But I'm on the winning side of this thing. And her audacious faith, like we've been talking about, was so prevalent in this entire thing. It was inspiring. So have that audacious kind of faith. Transfer day was here. So those two embryos that I was telling you about, the day was finally here that we were going to transfer those embryos. We were excited. We had everybody praying. I mean, we had journeyed with these nurses. I mean, you would think that her and the nurse were best friends at this point. They are praying in the office. We have everybody around the low country praying because we knew it was down to a science of the second that you had to put this, these, these embryos in. So we knew, 1019, we need everybody praying. And then we had everybody praying, believing Transfer day happens, and we waited, and we waited, and we waited some more. But every day we started off by this. We started every day by praying and thanking God in advance for the miracle that was going to take place. We knew the promise that he had for us, and we wanted to speak it into existence, the very thing that we felt like he gave to us. And that's what we did. And it all culminated on a day that finally came true, and we knew knew what was happening because Macy was hollering at the top of her lungs. She had the faintest, faintest of lines of a pregnancy test, and that's all she needed because she knew what the outcome was. I think they have a, yeah, so this is the expensive test, and so we had to have a deal because we were going through pregnancy tests at a very high rate. I don't know what these cost. What are they, $10, $15, something like that? Oh, there are more? Oh, man. Jeez, there are lots. I was like, can we get, like, the dollar store version of this thing? I mean, so she did. She got them, and it was the faintest of lines. And I wish we had the picture for it. I don't know if we do or not, but we literally had, like, five or six of them stacked up, and you could see the progression uh, of the line getting a little bit darker. Oh, my goodness, we were excited. Whoo! Finally, we're back in the seat. Man, we were excited. But it wasn't too many days after that amazing news that we experienced one of the toughest days of this entire journey. And it was obvious what was happening. You see, because we had already previously gone through a day like this, we'd already experienced one miscarriage. And so it was obvious to us because not only were we having all the same signs, all the same symptoms, all the stuff that go along with a miscarriage, but this time, this time was different because of the intensity. And so, man, it was another one of those moments where... Rubber meets the road, and I just remember that night so vividly of we were either going to panic or we were going to pray. 
we were either going to get super stressed out and worried again, or this was going to be another one of those opportunities where once again, we were going to put it in God's hands. And I just remember being in the middle of that night, and I remember us praying. Actually, let me say it this way. I remember fighting and believing for the miracle, going, God, you promised us. I'm at the end of my road. I have no more finances to give to this. This is my last ditch effort, God. You promised. God, I need you to show up. And it was that fight throughout that whole entire process. At the same time, you're trying to figure out, man, what's going to happen next? We're in the middle. Because when you're in the middle, it's a lot different than when you're at the end. You can celebrate there, but in the middle, you don't know what's going to happen. And I'm saying questions like, man, what are we going to do? How, how are we going to get through this? You know, it's one thing as, as the husband to go through this, but God, how am I going to help Macy through this whole thing? So the night gave way to the morning, and I just remember that next morning just what felt like I was driving crazy fast to get to the doctor because I just wanted some kind of relief. Please, God, if you just can work a miracle, can I get some kind of relief? And I remember looking over at Macy because she was so calm. We were listening to worship music, and I'm sitting there trying to figure out, why is she so calm? I wanted the peace that I saw sitting in my passenger seat, but I couldn't figure out how to pose a question that didn't kind of put her in a bad place, and so finally I just had the strength to just say, Macy, how, how are you doing? And I'll never forget what she says. She says this. She says, overall, I'm doing good. I know that God wants us to have children. So I have put it in God's hands. Here we are. We're in the middle. And even though we didn't have this massive move of God in our, in our car, like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Babe, you feel it's like a rushing mighty wind coming. I know that you, you all think pastors go through. Like, we don't feel all this crazy stuff, right? We're just like you guys. We're in the middle of this thing believing and screaming and crying out to God. So we pull into the parking lot. We pull up to the office, and we go inside. We see the doctor, and he brings us into the ultrasound room. We sit down, starts doing the ultrasound, and he says the words that you just don't want to hear. He says, well, this is what I expected. And immediately when he said that, Macy and I eyes immediately fell, filled up with just as many tears as you can have, instantly, as he turns that screen around to show us what in the world is going on, he says, you're having twins, huh, <laughs> oh my goodness, are you kidding me, you mean we're not having a miscarriage, we're having twins, what? Guys, it's, it's in the middle that we activate our faith. It's, it's something happens in the middle. It's in the middle where there's signs. It's in the middle where there's wonders. It's in the middle where there's miracles that God wants to unlock in your life. God is in the middle. And because of it, we have two amazing miracles of sons that even though they're three years old right now, and testing us like crazy, they are our miracle. God is in the middle of no matter what you have going on. Stay close to him. Activate your faith. Activate the growth of what God is doing. Activate the spiritual momentum because the promises that he has for you in your life and what scripture says will come true. Here's the promise that it says in Isaiah 43. It says this. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers of difficulty and you're not understanding how you're going to get through this, I don't know if I'm going to get this job. I'm going through the rivers of difficulty in my life. You will not drown. And when, when you walk through the fires of oppression and you say, I don't know how I'm getting out of this situation. I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. It just feels impossible. When you're going through the fires of oppression, you will not be burned up. 
and the flames will not consume you. That's the God that we serve. We serve the God of the beginning. We serve the God of the end. And we serve the God of the middle. God will show up and he will fight for you in the middle. God, we refuse to stay quiet. We refuse to go quietly into the night, God. But Father, we will praise you in the middle. We will trust you in the middle. We will rejoice in the middle and we will keep moving forward in the middle. And God, we just ask, Lord, would you just continue the work that you started with us in the beginning of the year? Lord, would you release your will in our life? In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen. amen. I hope that just touched you this morning. I hope it is exactly what you needed this morning. I just feel like, I just feel like God's wanting to prepare us. And guys, I just want to tell you this ain't going to end. Because I got one more treat for you before we leave. Because we got a series happening next week that I just... I just want to kind of build some anticipation for you because we've designed a series that, you know, Easter's coming, the biggest Sunday of the entire year. And we just want to get you guys prepared a little bit of why. Why Easter? And so if you ever have some friends, you go, at, you know, I want to hear the story from the very beginning of time all the way through. What is so important about this guy that you call Jesus? We want to design a series that we just, that y'all can't wait for. And that you know without a shadow of a doubt that you can invite your friends to. So take a look at the series promo, and then we'll end real quick. Take a look. The resurrection is the most important event in all of history. Because Jesus died and because he rose from the grave, everything changes. It means that Jesus is who he said he is and that he accomplished what he said he accomplished. The Son of God, the creator of everything, including you and me, put his feet on this earth. He breathed our air and lived among us. He entered into our pain and our shame and he died for us. But why? I mean, why Easter? To understand Easter and to understand the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we have to know the whole story. And we know every good story starts with in the beginning. First, we need to understand creation and what motivated God to create in the first place. I mean, what was it like for the first humans, Adam and Eve, to live in a perfect world without sickness, without disease, without conflict? Now, if that was the original design, what happened to mess it up and cause such severe consequences for all of mankind that we still feel the impact thousands of years later? And if God is all-knowing, then why did He even let it happen? I mean, what we do know is that Earth went from a paradise to a world filled with pain and suffering, which leads to tough questions like, why is life so hard? Why does evil even exist? Is there any way back to this paradise? You see, the solution to our dilemma is found in one person, Jesus. But how? The Son of God embarks on the greatest rescue mission ever. Jesus comes to earth as a human baby, submitting himself to the natural growth process and lives among us. Crazy, right? And again, this brings to mind more tough questions. I mean, if Jesus is all-powerful Son of God, why did He even have to be born? I mean, what was the purpose of His coming to earth? And what can we learn from His life and His relationships? I mean, why was Jesus even baptized? And why did He spend so much time telling stories to large groups of people? I mean, how did He choose His 12 disciples and why? You see, his followers knew something. They knew that he was the Son of God and that he knew that he was on a mission to heal and restore. What didn't make sense was Jesus telling them that in order to accomplish this mission, he would have to die. And on top of that, that it was going to be gruesome. Why did Jesus have to die on a cross, crucified like a common criminal? And how could an all-knowing, 
all-loving, all-powerful God allow such a horrific event to take place? I mean, what was the purpose of Jesus being crucified and how does that one event impact my life today? You see, we're gonna explore this all throughout this entire Easter series. But here's the cool thing, is that the story doesn't end with his death on a cross or his body in a tomb. Easter is coming and the tomb will be empty because the power of God will raise Jesus from the dead. And because Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave, now, oh, now a life of immeasurably more is available to us. Yes, his resurrection. That, oh, that changes everything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So come, be ready, be excited for that series. I just believe that God's going to continue this journey that we're on, and it's going to be absolutely incredible. Uh, you remember that verse I was telling you about of, the, of, of how God is the provider of an immeasurably more life? Not only did we get through that whole series of events, but where are we going to have to do it again? And he showed up in such a huge, huge way because he gave us a free baby. We didn't have to go through IVF process again, and we had baby trad. And you can see a picture here. That's that little nugget right there on the bottom left, or right there in the middle. Look at that awesome, beautiful little scrunchy face. Love it. I absolutely love it. But guys, I pray for you that if you, if you found yourself in the middle, know that you can draw close to God, and he will come through to you. Keep going on the journey, because God has great plans for you this year. I bless you as you go, in Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys so much. Keep up the great work. Have a great weekend.